Hello, this is Brian Riling, and we're going to talk about the 2020 Livestock Management CDE uh, for the state of Nebraska. Uh, we're going to talk about the sheep station with a disciplinary focus on breeding, genetic, and reproductive management for 2020. Uh, in this particular station, students should be able to understand differences between dominance and recessiveness, should be able to work out a Punnett square. They should be able to identify basic genetic disorders of sheep, discuss phenotype, uh, the fact that uh, it is a combination of both genetics and environmental influence. They should understand the relative heritability of traits. They should be able to utilize genetic evaluations from the uh, uh, National Sheep Improvement Program. And then they should be able to interpret some scenarios and uh, practice and utilize some basic selection methods. When we talk about dominance versus recessiveness, this is most likely easily done uh, if we discuss white versus black fibered sheep. Uh, white happens to be a dominant trait, black happens to be a recessive trait. So when we talk about a white animal, they may be homozygous dominant, big W, big W, or they could be heterozygous, big W, little w. Either way, they're gonna have a white wool color. Black wool is a recessive trait, so they're gonna have to be homozygous recessive, little w, little w, to be black. As a result, we essentially have two different phenotypes. We've got white sheep and we've got black sheep, but we have three genotypes. They could be homozygous dominant WW, they could be heterozygous big W little W, or they could be homozygous recessive. So two phenotypes, three genotypes, of basically affecting wool color, okay? Now, we could go ahead and put that together with a Punnett square, and I'm sure many of your uh, students have likely done this, but we've got the, uh, uh, the ram on the top side, big W, little w, he is heterozygous. We've got the uh, female, she's gonna be heterozygous as well, uh, big W, little w. Obviously, they will retrieve one allele at random from both the dam as well as the sire. And so that basically gives us uh, three, these three combinations uh, where we see uh, a white lamb. It's only in the case where we receive the two recessive alleles one from the dam, one from the sire, that we actually get the black sheep. So we effectively have a 25% chance from the mating of two heterozygous individuals to receive a black lamb. Three-fourths of them are gonna be white, but half of those lambs, or half of the total lambs, 50% chance that they're gonna be actually carriers. So have a heterozygous uh, genotype. Now, Okay, that's fairly simple, but where it comes into play is when we talk about uh, some genetic disorders. For example, scrapie is a disease that we're trying to uh, certainly eradicate in the, in the United States, like to eliminate it. Well, it happens to be that scrapie is an infectious neurological degenerative, degenerative disease, uh, commonly seen or characterized with a sloughing of the hair and the wool uh, coming off. This is caused by a prion or uh, basically the same type of organism uh, that causes uh, BSE, bovine spongiform encephalopathy. We've discovered that this particular uh, gene is located at codon 171. That's the location of the coding gene for susceptibility to scraping. Uh, and, there's, and it's controlled by a single gene pair. The Q allele is basically animals that are, would make them susceptible to scrapie. That is recessive. The R allele means that they're resistant to scrapie and that is a dominant trait, fortunately. So animals that may be homozygous dominant, RR, or even those that are heterozygous, QR, are actually resistant uh, to scrapie. It's only those animals that are QQ uh, that are actually genetically susceptible to scraping. Now, this does not mean that they have the disease. It simply means that they are susceptible if they were to be exposed uh, to the disease-causing organism. So let's take uh, some examples in terms of what students might be asked to do in this particular station. Okay, so here's a scenario. A healthy prized rams discovered to have a codon 171 genotype of QQ. Again, that doesn't mean he's got scrapie, he just happens to have the genotype of QQ. 
If mated to a homozygous scrapie resistant ewes, what percentage of his offspring would be uh, resistant to scrapie if exposed? What percentage of his offspring would be carriers of the susceptibility allele? Okay, so what we can do is we can put together a Punnett square. Let's put together what we know. Uh, we know this RAM is going to be QQ. Okay, we uh, know that the uh, ewes to which he, you plan to breed them are going to be RR. We said they're homozygous, scrapie resistant. Assuming they get one allele from the dam and one allele from the uh, female, uh, or excuse me, the sire, all of the offspring are going to be QR. All of the offspring, 100% of them, are going to be resistant to scrapie. However, all of them are also carriers of the susceptibility allele. Every one of them um, is heterozygous. Let's talk about spider lamb syndrome, okay? Spider, lamb, spider syndrome is also a genetic disorder. It's called ovine hereditary chondro, chondro dysplasia. Okay. Basically, there's abnormal, abnormal cartilage and bone development, and we uh, essentially the legs start to deform, and they're unable to stand or have extreme difficulty standing. Okay. Now, this is typically found in black-faced breeds of sheep, and again, it's caused by a detrimental recessive gene. Okay. Normal, cat big N, is dominant. Spider, the little n, fortunately, is a recessive gene. Okay. So what we've got is if we have an animal that is homozygous dominant, big N, big N, he's going to be perfectly healthy. If we have an animal who is genetically heterozygous, big N, little N, he likewise is going to be perfectly healthy, but he's a carrier of that spider gene. It's only in the case where we get these two recessive detrimental alleles coming together and we have homozygous recessive little N, little N that we're gonna have a lamb that's eventually going to develop this spider syndrome. So let's put together another example of a question that we might ask for students. We might say, okay, we're gonna take a phenotypically normal ram was exposed to a known carrier female, the spider syndrome. Shortly after birth, one lamb from a set of triplets showed physical signs of the syndrome. The question might be, what was the ram's genotype for spider? So again, let's set up a Punnett square and let's put in the information that we know, okay? We know that the female was a carrier. If she was a carrier, she had to be heterozygous, big N, little n. On the uh, sire side, we know that he was phenotypically normal. Well, if he was phenotypically normal, he had to carry at least one dominant normal allele. However, in the offspring, we know that we had one show up that was a spider, okay? In order for the, that spider phenotype to show up, it had to be homozygous recessive, little n, little n. So that's in our Punnett square. Well, in order for, he had to get one of the little n's from the carrier, you. He also had to draw a little n from the sire. So hence, that ram had to be big N, little n. He was also a carrier for the spider uh, gene. Now, you might also ask, okay, what percentage of the phenotypically normal offspring would be carriers? Well, we've got the Punnett square put together. Uh, a quarter of the offspring should be homozygous dominant, homozygous normal. Uh, half of the offspring are going to be heterozygous carriers. But as a percentage of the phenotypically normal offspring, those three of four are going to be normal, okay? Those three are going to be normal. Of those three that are normal, two-thirds of them are going to be carriers. So 66% of his phenotypically normal offspring are actually expected to be carriers. Okay, so there's a number of other inherited defects, uh, and almost all defects are recessive in nature, and many of them are controlled by a single gene pair. Now, producers are rarely going to keep uh, such animals for breeding. Those are actually showing the physical defect. And so, as a result, defects result from the mating of phenotypically normal but genetically heterozygous parents. A couple of other additional examples. 
hairy lamb syndrome called ectodermal dysplasia. Now there's no genetic test available to identify the particular genotype, okay? But this is present, dwarfism, okay? Again, it's a homozygous recessive gene, detrimental recessive gene that's come in that's gonna cause animals to be extremely small compared to their normal counterparts. Jaw defects, cryptorchidism, okay, where basically one of the testes doesn't descend and it remains up in the body. These are all what are considered inherited homozygous recessive detrimental genes. And you can figure out uh, the odds of something happening using the Punnett square like we've just described for spider um, as well as the uh, other defects, okay? All right, let's move into quantitative traits. Let's move into uh, uh, growth rates, uh, prolificacy, reproduction, okay? When we talk about such traits, uh, the phenotype of an animal is equivalent to two things, genotype plus environment. Now, selection is ultimately based upon phenotype, and I'm not meaning just how they physically look, but the records that you collect on those. Birth weight is a phenotype, weaning weight, yearling weight, uh, post weaning average daily gain, all of those measurements that we might deem to be records are actually phenotypes. They are the animal's performance and it's affected by two things. It's affected by the genetic ability of that animal and environmental influence, okay? Um, they had a higher level of nutrition. They had better health care. All of those things provide an advantage. That is environment, okay? So phenotype is not only the looks, but what we measure weights, average daily gain is a phenotype. Phenotype equals genetics plus environment. And only that is due to genetics. And that's why I highlighted the G, the genetics. Only that, that portion of their phenotypic advantage that's due to genetics can be transmitted. And what percentage is, is due to genetics? That is called heritability, okay? Now here's basically a chart that puts uh, kind of lumps traits together. Most reproductive traits are considered to be lowly heritable. In other words, less than 20% of the differences you see between two lambs is actually due to genetics. For example, lamb one uh, has triplets. Uh, lamb two only has a single. Well, okay, we're gonna think that the one that had triplets is a lot more desirable. But in all reality, only 20% of it was actually due to genetics. It's lowly heritable trait, okay? Growth performance, uh, weights, average daily gain is considered to be low to moderate in terms of heritability dependent upon the trait, okay? So 10 to 40% of the differences that we see between animals is due to genetics. Carcass traits, highly heritable. Uh, 30 to 40% of the differences that we see between two animals is due to genetics. We talk about the fleece, okay? Grease, uh, uh, fleece weight, staple length. It's a moderate to highly heritable. 25 to 55% of the differences that you see between fleeces of different animals is due to genetics. When they talk about the dairy component, they're talking about milk production. 30 to 45% due to genetics. Okay? So again, heritability is the percentage of phenotypic variation, the percentage, the, the amount of the difference between two animals that is actually due to genetics. Here's a chart that we put together, phenotypic versus genetic superiority. Let's assume we take a population of uh, market lambs, okay? Or a population of lambs. Let's say the average daily gain for that entire population was 0.7 pounds per day. It had a standard deviation of 0.1. That's simply a measure of the variation. And when you basically go out plus or minus two standard deviations, and that's what I've done on this chart, uh, 0.5 is two standard deviations, less than the mean, 0.9 is two standard deviations greater than the mean. Plus or minus two standard deviations within a population represents about 95% of the lambs in that population fall within that range. So in other words, in this example, uh, for this population, if those numbers are true, 95% of the lambs would have gains between 0.5 and 0.9 pounds per day. Now, if we were to actually select a a lamb from this population and we uh, wanted to uh, see how much we could maybe move the uh, genetics uh, uh, using him as a potential sire compared to the average lamb from that group, 
we're gonna try to select somebody that's clear over on this tail, right? Okay, uh, we don't. We want to move uh, this top of this curve in the direction of the point nine. So let's say we select an animal over here that's one pound a day. Okay, he grew really well. So we select that guy. Okay. Well, his phenotypic superiority compared to the average of the flock from which he was grew uh, is three tenths. He gained a pound. The average lamb in the flock gained seven tenths. Well, one minus 0. 0.7. He was three pound, 0.3 pounds per day better than the average. That was his phenotypic superiority. Okay. Now, how much of that's actually due to genetics? If we assume that the heritability of average daily gain was 33%, his breeding value would be 0.33, okay, that's 33% heritability, times his phenotypic superiority, three-tenths of a pound. His breeding value is 0.1 pounds per day. That is his, represents his genetic superiority compared to the average sire from that same pop, from that same population. Okay, that's his genetic superiority. Okay, now that brings us to uh, the National Sheep Improvement Program with EBVs, expected breeding values and indexes. Now, I'm gonna give you some references uh, that will provide explanations for what all of these mean and how we might utilize them. Weight traits include birth weight, weaning weight, maternal weaning weight, post weaning weight, and yearling weight, okay? Uh, there's some EBVs for body composition, fat depth, loin eye muscle depth, an indicator of muscle, and then they've also got what's called a carcass plus index. Uh, that is an index that economically weights uh, weaning weight, post weaning weight, eye muscle depth, and fat cover. Uh, so it puts a little bit of growth in there with a significant emphasis on the carcass side of things. 100 theoretically is average. There's also some reproduction uh, breeding values. Number of bo lambs born, number of lambs weaned, and then there's also one that's called SRC dollar, but it stands for self-replacing uh, dollar index. Uh, it is designed for more terminal breeds such as Suffolk. Uh, Hampshire's other black-faced breeds. Uh, so it's basically a uh, index for replacement value, but yet maintaining some emphasis on carcass traits. Again, 100 uh, theoretically is average. Now the thing that's different about sheep genetic evaluations that are now published with the NSIP is that they are breeding values. They are not EPDs like we typically see in the cattle site. So if you were to convert it, uh, basically the utilization is very, very similar. However, an EPD puts everything at the progeny level. An EPD equals one half of the breeding value. So we're actually giving you the genetic value of the sire, not what's going to be projected into its offspring. That's what an EPD does. Okay, so here's some example uh, EPD or example sire uh, summary that we might put together. These are estimated breeding values uh, for weaning weight, maternal weaning weight, post weaning weight, number of lambs born, number of lambs weaned, and then that carcass plus index. And so we might have some questions. Uh, and these are actual, uh, actual data from various lambs that I pulled from that NSIP uh, database. Question number one, which ram's daughter should be the most prolific? Okay, we talk about prolificacy, we're talking about the number of lambs that would be born. And so the answer would be two. She's got a, is the, has a significant positive value of 0.14, significantly greater than anything else in this group. Which rams market lamb progeny should offer the greatest profit potential? Well, that carcass plus index is a dollar or profitability index, okay? Answer would be three. He has the highest carcass plus value of 162.22. Question three, which ram's female replacement should have the most milk production? Okay, uh, they really don't have a actual milk value, but similar to cattle, they have a maternal weaning weight, okay? And that is a reflection of the milk production 
in the female. And uh, number four has a significantly higher uh, maternal weaning weight value, breeding value, than any of the others in here. Question four maybe makes people think just a little bit. Which ram provides the most direct growth without sacrificing maternal traits? I would say the answer to that is four because weaning weight is a reflection of direct growth to weaning. Post weaning weight is a direct reflection of the gainability of those animals, of those lambs when we put them in the feedlot. And while number four is not the highest in both of those categories, uh, that would actually be three, and, but while he's not the highest, we don't give anything up, okay? His daughter should be really heavy milking as evidenced by that two plus maternal weaning weight value. And while his number of lambs born and number of lambs weaned, uh, may not be stellar, at least it's not negative. We're not giving anything up. So I would answer that four probably gives me the most direct growth without sacrificing maternal traits. Okay, so when we talk about uh, the usage of data and genetic evaluations, what might we ask your, the students to do? First of all, we may have some basic test questions uh, on there. Uh, we may ask you to answer some genetic scenarios similar to what I just described with uh, uh, the spider lamb syndrome or with scrapey, okay? We may put together a sire summary quiz. We're gonna put some EBVs for various rams and ask you similar questions to what we just discussed uh, uh, with that example. The other thing that we may very well do is have a keep call group of, uh, of breeding ewes uh, with data and you'll have to identify which four are the most desirable to keep, which are the four the most should be called, and uh, we'll have data and have to be able to answer some questions. Those are the types of things I would expect uh, students to be able to do. Number of resources that I'll provide to you, uh, there's uh, three of these that are PDF documents. One's called Basic Sheep Genetics, one's called uh, Sheep Breeding, Heritability, EBVs, EPDs, and the NSIP. And then also the NSIP puts a, uh, uh, a notebook together that they provide descriptions and interpretations for exactly what do these breeding values mean and, and how might we use them in a selection program. Uh, this last one's a website that actually takes you to the NSIP website. Uh, and you could even look up uh, values for lambs if you wanted to. So number of resources there. The other component is gonna be reproduction. I'm gonna be honest, we're not gonna probably have a lot on the reproduction uh, with this year, but some things that your students should know. They should know and understand normal breeding habits of sheep. Most sheep tend to be what we refer to as fall breeders, short day breeders. They reproductively respond to a decrease in day length. Uh, and they should know some basic reproductive numbers, okay? When do sheep reach puberty, sexual maturity? What's the length and duration of estrus, okay? In other words, how long are they showing estrus? How long are they receptive to mating? When do they actually ovulate? Uh, if by chance, we don't use a lot of it, but it's increasing. Uh, if we were to artificially inseminate a ewe, we certainly wanna try to inseminate as close to the time of ovulation as possible. What's the gestation length? Um, scrotal circumference is commonly, uh, is a measurement that we can take in rams, just like we do in bulls. What's an appropriate scrotal circumference? Uh, if I were to use natural service, what's an appropriate RAM to U ratio? Those are the types of questions that uh, students should be able to answer relative to sheep reproduction. Gonna provide you a number of resources. Uh, we'll give you the link, uh, but New Mexico State University has a good website that talks about uh, reproduction. And there's also a program uh, called Sheep 101. Uh, this looks at ewe reproduction and, rare, and ram reproduction, gives some really good information uh, in a fairly short, concise uh, program. And I would encourage uh, your students to review those, review those uh, prior to the, uh, the CDE. Uh, with that, that's basically what you can expect for the sheep station. And I thank you very much, and I wish everybody the best of luck. Thank you very much, and have a good day.